Hi everyone, this is Lori Jill Eisenstadt, IBCLC, the host of All About Breastfeeding, the place where the girls hang out. As I lay awake last night, not being able to fall asleep, I made an executive decision and decided to take this week off from releasing the two shows I usually do each week. I was trying to figure out how I could possibly swing going away for the July 4th weekend. Getting two shows ready for the coming week just makes that impossible. Then I reminded myself, as I so often need to do when making decisions for the show, Lori, this is your show. You are the boss. You can do what you want. What do you want to do, Lori? What do you want to do, Lori? Well, I did not have to think about it at all. I wanted to take off July 4th weekend. But how could I possibly do that and keep the flow of the show going? My earth-shattering answer to myself was, why not repeat two previous shows? I already know that once listeners get turned on to this show, they go back and listen to previous shows. You tell me that all the time. I now have over 70 shows, and that's a lot to go through, so perhaps there are some that you have missed. And even if you have heard the show before, I hope you will still listen, or at least skip to the end, where this time around I add my personal commentary, highlights of the interview that I expand on at the end of the show. On this show, we're going to listen to Dr. Jack Newman, which was episode number 44. And at the end, I share my personal thoughts about his work in South Africa. I share what I think about that thing that happened that changed the course of his whole career and discuss the lack of breastfeeding education in medical school and how that impacts mothers who breastfeed. Feedback is always welcomed. So don't be shy. Go to iTunes and subscribe to the show and leave a review. Tell me what you like, what you're not so much a fan of, what you want more of. And did you like the replays? Here is the interview. Enjoy. If I wanted the mothers to have one thing, I would say the breastfed baby is not like the formula fed baby. You cannot take information about formula feeding and transfer it to the baby. This is where we go so wrong. And that breastfeeding is much more than milk. Breastfeeding is a close, intimate relationship between two people who are usually in love with each other. And that is what is so special about breastfeeding. Balloons, bazookas, boob, boobies, Bosoms, boulders, cans, hooters, knockers, melons, honkers, jugs, rack, tatas, tits, torpedoes, guns, bust, doorknobs, coconuts, and our favorite one, the girls. Welcome to the All About Breastfeeding Show, where your host, Lori, highlights mothers just like yourself and goes beyond the surface questions and digs deep so they share not only their joys and happiness in their daily breastfeeding life, but also their pain and struggles and and how they worked through them. Today, I have the joy and the pleasure of introducing a man that I have admired for many years. While I have seen him speak and have shaken his hand a few times and said a few words at conferences, I have not had the opportunity to sit down with him and talk in detail about his personal life as well as his public life. I know I sound like a huge fan and I am. This lovely gentleman that I speak of is Dr. Jack Newman. I'm going to highlight some of his major accomplishments and add his complete biography to the show notes where I encourage you to read them in full. Dr. Jack Newman graduated from the University of Toronto Medical School. He trained in pediatrics in Quebec City and then at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. He is a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians in Canada and a board certified by the American Academy of Pediatrics in 1981. Dr. Jack Newman has worked as a physician in Central America, New Zealand, and South Africa. Dr. Newman has a working resume several paragraphs long with where he was interned, studied, and worked. 
He has a distinct honor of founding the first hospital-based breastfeeding clinic in Canada in 1984. While he was a staff pediatrician in the ER department at the Hospital for Sick Children, the breastfeeding clinic that he started became widely popular and began taking up so much of his time that he eventually began working there full time. He currently works at the IBC, which stands for International Breastfeeding Center in Toronto. He is the author of several publications, including DVDs in several languages on breastfeeding, and these will all be listed in the show notes. His first book, Jack Newman's Guide to Breastfeeding, is how I first became acquainted with Dr. Newman and his wisdom and humor in the breastfeeding world. This book has been through several revisions and is currently called The Ultimate Breastfeeding Book of Answers. I should also say that he has co-written these books with Teresa Pittman. I quote from this book all the time, encourage new parents to purchase this as it has a wealth of great information. His website, which I will link to in the show notes, is also a wealth of information, which I use on a daily basis between my private clients and the breastfeeding classes I teach. Dr. Jack Newman, I would love to welcome you to the All About Breastfeeding show. Thanks for being here. Thank you, thank you for inviting me, it's a pleasure. All right, so I'm so glad that I have this opportunity to hang out with you. Like I said, I have shook your hands, but you know, I'm one of a million, and I've asked you a question or two in a conference, but now I get to ask some of the questions that I, I think a lot of us want to know. And so I'm excited to get started. And I'd love for you to be able to give us a little personal information. I always like hearing where my guests grew up and what life was like for them in the family they grew up in. All right, I guess. Uh, I was born in a small city near Tel Aviv. Well, my parents and I, not I alone, we uh, immigrated to Canada when I was 15 months old. So I grew up in Toronto. I'm an only child. Then I uh, uh, have uh, three children, the oldest of which will be 40 this year. Wow. And, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and the youngest who will be uh, 32 this year. And there's a girl in the middle who is 35 and uh, about to get married. I've worked as a, a pediatrician for many years and mainly in the emergency department up until 1992 when I gave my full time to the breastfeeding clinic. I do a fair bit of traveling. I was just in China in December for three weeks. I've spoken in every state in the United States over the years and every province in Canada. So I guess I've been around for a while. Yep, you get around, Dr. Newman. Mm -hmm. So is China pleasure and or business? It was business. I spoke in uh, Beijing and Taiwan, Hong Kong and Macau. It was less of a pleasure because of the smog in Beijing I actually started coughing and coughing, and then I probably got a virus, and it lasted for three weeks. <laughs> oh, that's no fun. Did you, so did you get that at the tail end and came home with it? No, I got it at the close to the beginning. <laughs> oh, no. Well, I managed to talk, but I still have a bit of uh, a bit of something. I don't know what it is, but it's okay. It's getting better. So you had to come home to start recovering. Yes, get away from the smog. Yes, wow, it's pretty intense, and and you're not used to it, so. Well, we have our smog, but not like not like I saw in uh, Beijing, and you know they they have these red alerts which they've never had before, just as I was there. The red alerts for the air quality. Yeah, where schools and factories are all closed, uh, where you can take your car out only two days a week, based on your license plate number, but you know people that are well off enough can have license plate number that are both even and odd so they can use their cars all the time anyway <laughs> that reminds me of in new york when we had the gas crunch and we and the, we had the odd and even and people would do the same thing there's always a way for people to get around the laws right always that's pretty interesting though that's things like in in america that we don't get to hear about can you tell us how or when you knew that you wanted to become a physician and then to further specify that a pediatrician? I guess my father uh, sort of eased me into becoming a doctor because uh, I, I probably was about five or six years old and he hurt his thumb. 
I did some uh, unusual type of medicine. I stuck his thumb with a nail, as I remember well, and he uh, said, oh, that's great. It's cured. And <laughs> he really sucked me in there, I think. <laughs> I always wanted to be a doctor from that age on, maybe before, I can't remember, but I always wanted to be a doctor. And when people ask me, why do you want to become a doctor? I said, because I'll be able to travel. You can be a doctor anywhere. And in those days, it is true. You could, I could just write a letter to New Zealand and say, I'd like to come down and do some, something down there, maybe work in a hospital as a resident or as a, an intern. And it was pretty well, sure, come on down, let's do it. But that's changed. Right. When you said that, I, I like took a little step back in my brain. My son is in medical school and, you know, we talk about, I mean, he's in school in Iowa and we talk about going from state to state and out of the country. And that was my first inclination. I'm like, wow, that's not the same the way it is now. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, but I still get to travel because of uh, doing breastfeeding conferences. Yes. Yeah, so you've wound up you wound up finding your niche and being able to travel anyway. Yep. So I'd love to hear, there's a lot of conversations that we can have. One of the ones, whether you're male or female, I'd love to ask my guests if you ever had a conversation with your mother, if you were breastfed. Not until I started doing this type of work. And then the more I was doing it, the longer my mother breastfed me. So I, <laughs> I don't think she... I don't think she really remembered by the time I was asking her. Uh, she, she had it so confused in her mind that not that she was senile yet, but she just, you know, it was so long ago. She really didn't uh, remember exactly. The only hint I have is that I have a photo in a hospital in Israel where they have a picture of all the babies there and only one is being bottle fed and it's not me. So... I guess I was breastfed for a while, but not very long because my mother got sick with a pulmonary embolus after after she gave birth. And uh, in those days, they were always telling mothers to stop breastfeeding for all sorts of reasons. Right. And I don't know if what was doing in Israel, but here it was very common to take medication, give mom a pill to help dry her up, right? Yep. And your mom had a pulmonary embolism afterwards, so that's pretty intense also. Yeah, but she survived. She was generally in good health until 92. I'd love to hear your story uh, to explain to my audience about your journey from a medical student and being, I imagine, quite unfamiliar with the breastfeeding mother to your OBGYN experiences and all the way through pediatrics, um, going to Africa and then coming back to your clinic in Canada. So I'd love to hear how that all evolved. Well, of course, like almost every medical school uh, uh, we were taught nothing about breastfeeding. In fact, I can say uh, my story is that uh, we had one hour on infant feeding when we were in fourth year medical school. And the pediatrician stood up in front of the class and said, breast is best because it always comes in the right temperature and also comes in such cute containers. Now, <laughs> let me tell you about formula. And the rest of the hour was on formula making. We really learned nothing at all about breastfeeding. And that was true in uh, internship. It was even true in pediatric residency. We really, really learned nothing, nothing formal. And I think that has not changed, not uh, really significantly. The only thing that we got out of pediatric training is that breastfeeding mothers are a pain in the neck. And the babies, you know, if they're in hospital, you can't measure how much they're getting of the fluid and you can't tell anything about them. And boy, they are the breastfeeding mothers always wanted to stay. What a nuisance they were. That's what we learned about breastfeeding. So you learned that we were a pain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we didn't learn it formally. We didn't they didn't say, boy, these breastfeeding mothers are a pain. But, you know, we would want the nurses, of course, uh, would say, you know, the mother should go home. They shouldn't be here. Uh, this was still in the era where mothers were uh, discouraged from staying. Uh, they, they weren't, you know, they weren't not allowed to stay, but they were discouraged from staying. And then the nurses would always say, oh, you know, we can take much better care of the babies than the mothers can, which, of course, was a lie. Well, not a deliberate lie, but it was uh, untrue. And basically... You know, we, we, that's what we learned. And it's not surprising that so many physicians and pediatricians really don't understand anything about breastfeeding. 
if they if things may be better now, they may learn some theoretical information about breastfeeding, but that never translates into real knowledge about how breastfeeding works or how you know how to prevent problems with breastfeeding and how to help mothers uh, with breastfeeding if uh, problems arise. Yeah, I mean, if I could make a, a a blanket statement, which I know isn't everybody, but as a lactation consultant, I have helped many physicians, and frequently they will say to me, whatever, whether they're an anesthesiologist, whether they're truly a pediatrician or an OBGYN, uh, midwives will frequently tell me when they're having, they come to me because they're having breastfeeding issues, they will often start off by saying, just treat me like, you need to treat me like any other mother because I find people are treating me as if I know this stuff. And guess what? I don't really know this stuff. So you need to treat me like you do any other mom. And so I know from working with physicians, my son is in his fourth year of medical school. He did two rounds of pediatric rotation and breastfeeding was not talked about at all. So in some schools it might be, but across the board, I think it's very little information other than in a very positive way that breastfeeding is good for the mother and baby and they may talk about the health benefits, but like you said, there's little to no clinical information. And I always think it's it's always interesting when um, physicians have such a hard time. I remember when my first baby was born, the, the, the biggest thing that would happen is I would go to the pediatrician, they would be very frustrated with the fact that I could not tell them two very important things. One is how frequently Alicia fed and how much she took. And they would just shake their heads and almost feel like they couldn't help me. And even as a lay person, I remember I would say to them, but this is how much she's supposed to be gaining, right? That was my big question. And they'd already say yes, but they were still frustrated that they didn't have that information. Yes, the whole basis of medicine is based is, is <clears throat> numbers and numbers. And the problem is that it doesn't apply to breastfeeding. And it certainly doesn't apply if you don't understand breastfeeding. So that this whole notion that baby should feed, you know, every three hours or the baby should feed 15 minutes on each side. This is the sort of stuff that physicians and in fact, most health professionals, this is what they like. They like to be able to document the numbers and the numbers really have nothing to do with breastfeeding. And if you watch our videos, you'll see that there you can tell, you know, that a baby is not necessarily getting milk just because they're on the breast and sucking. And that's a very important issue. And it, it, it goes across the board. It grows across the board, for example, for lactation consultants who tell mothers, you must feed the baby on just one breast so that the baby gets the hind milk. But the thing is, if the baby's not drinking, he's not getting hind milk because he's not getting any milk. And so we see in our clinic, we see a, a large number of mothers who have had a significant decrease in their milk supply basically because they're feeding the baby on just one breast and keeping the baby to one breast. And this may work at the beginning, for example, but it doesn't work inevitably and it doesn't work uh, for weeks and months because when you feed on just one breast, the milk supply decreases. But this comes from the lack of knowledge of how to know a baby's actually getting milk from the breast. And just because a baby's on the breast and sucking doesn't mean he's getting milk. And so this is such a basic piece of information, which nobody seems to know. I don't know why. I mean, I keep hearing 15 minutes on each side, one breast per feeding, 10% weight loss, and all these numbers that make absolutely no sense. Yes, and I, I think that you probably realize the same thing, that you hear the same things again and again in, in a private practice, and then there's a wave of something new. I think that information became fairly public knowledge in most of the mainstream books and magazines, whereas for a long time it was just in the lactation textbooks. And now, you know, I have a lot of little jokes about all these things associated with breastfeeding. And one of them, when moms tell me about leaving on one breast, if they don't say, because I want the baby to get the hind milk, I then ask them, can you tell me why you do that? And then almost always they'll say, because I want the baby to get the high milk. So then I say, 
So how long do you need to leave your baby on the right breast to get the hind milk? And they'll say, I don't know. And then I'll say, how much hind milk should your baby be getting? I don't know. And then they start looking at me and they're like, oh, I see what you're saying. And then I go on to have a conversation similar to what you just started to say that, you know, they need to get the both sides. I mean, there are some moms we know who have an abundant supply, but most mothers, if their babies can be satisfied on one side in the very early days, they will quickly up the ante because they're growing, getting bigger and they want more. And moms are just trying like the Dickens that, you know, the babies are fussing, they're coming off after 15 to 20 minutes and they're seeing if they need to burp, walking around, calming them and putting them right back on the same side. So I'm sure you see the same things, right? Exactly. Yeah. And that's right. And so what works when the baby's three weeks old doesn't work anymore when the baby's three months old, when the milk supply is decreased, because if you feed on just one breast at a feeding, the milk supply will definitely decrease. And frequently they'll say, well, my best friend, my mother, my whatever. And then we talk about, you know, the amount of milk you, you have, the amount of milk your baby takes for feeding, your baby needs more and go down that whole pathway. But many a breastfeeding relationship goes awry for exactly that reason, because they're keeping the baby on one breast. And what we see is many of these mothers actually continue to have a good milk supply, but babies don't care what's in the breast they care what they get and so that three week old that was doing fine on just one breast by three months is often pulling at the breast and crying at the breast and not being uh really happy even though they continue to gain weight they are not happy babies anymore and then they go to the doctor or the pediatrician and what do they hear oh your baby's got reflux here's medicine they don't have reflux they are responding to a decrease in milk flow they're hungry, right? Well, they're hungry in a way, in the sense that they want faster flow. But because some of these mothers, or many of these mothers, have started off with an abundant milk supply, a decrease in their milk supply doesn't necessarily mean not enough milk. So, in fact, some of these babies grow very well. And I have, even though they're not happy babies anymore, and I have several photos of babies, you know, some of them that are huge, that are four months old, and very miserable babies... And all we did was uh, treat the uh, mother uh, with uh, domperidone to increase her milk supply. And all of a sudden, we have another happy baby. Right. We're going to get to that domperidone. I want to hear about how you decided to go to Africa and what you learned there. Because before you went to Africa, were you that turned on to breastfeeding moms? Not in particular. I mean, my we had already had our first baby. In fact, we had already had our second baby by the time we went to Africa. I applied just because I wanted to do something uh, different. I didn't want to start an office uh, right away as soon as I finished my pediatrics. I had done general practice before I went into pediatrics, and I know that some of my classmates had gone into, you know, a general pediatric office, and I could tell they were bored. You know, the same old thing all over again, all over again, you know, colds, cough, ear infections and that sort of thing. And so I said, no, 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 I don't want to do that right away. And so I applied for jobs around the world. I, uh, the job I actually wanted, the one in teach at the university in Malaysia, didn't happen because we had a postal strike in Canada at that time. And the letter saying, come and come and let us know if you want to come by August 1st. I didn't get it until September when the mail started again. But this was good because I worked in South Africa. I enjoyed the work very much, although it was very difficult and very uh, emotionally trying because children were so sick. They were dying. The babies were dying all the time. It was uh, because they were being formula fed. Older children were dying from rheumatic fever and the complications of uh, rheumatic fever. But, you know, by that time, I had two breastfeeding children, and it was something that I saw that was really interesting and very good. I even got uh, scolded by a, by a medical student who said that my two-year-old shouldn't be breastfeeding anymore, imagine. What instrument did you look to bop that medical student over the head? I just looked at her in, in, in complete surprise. I just couldn't believe it. I don't actually remember because, you know, my two-year-old is now 40. So it was 38 years ago. But I just remember the incident. I don't remember the detail. <laughs> That's enough, though. To re- no, really, just to remember the incident that a medical student told you that. 
Indeed, indeed. And the situation in South Africa was different for black mothers and for white mothers. They delivered in different hospitals uh, because they were segregated. And basically, uh, you know, white mothers got, you know, a nicer hospital, but also got a lot of free formula samples, a lot of interruptions of breastfeeding, just as we see in North America. Whereas we did, formula was not even allowed in the hospital where I was working. In fact, bottles were not allowed in the hospital where I was working. And I had to start to make do with some things that were contrary to my experience at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, where, for example, premature babies often got bottles. And this notion, which is completely wrong, that a baby needs to learn how to take a bottle, a premature baby needs to take, take a bottle before you can try them on the breast, which is completely ridiculous and nonsensical, I had to sort of uh, rearrange my mind. Yeah, here frequently that's their get home pass, right? Yeah, that's right. If uh, We can let you go home if the baby bottle feeds. Right. So it sounds like helping mothers with breastfeeding in Africa was really on the fly. Yes, yes, I had no choice. A lot of the mothers were using formula because the advertising for companies like Nestle's was all over the place. Uh, in fact, one of the white hospitals, uh, well, it wasn't actually a white hospital. This is one of the uh, hospitals that sort of was integrated, but it was for relatively well-off people. They used to give out. They, they, it was run by nuns from Switzerland, and naturally, they were giving out formula. In fact, uh, it was great advertising for Nestle's because every Wednesday they would give out free formula, not to uh, hospital patients, but to anybody. And there was a lineup around the block of mothers who wanted to get this formula, and they just gave it out for nothing. The fact that the nuns were Swiss makes it a little bit gives me a pain in the neck and a pain in the stomach to think that Nest, they were working for Nestle's. Right. I'm just curious if you have knowledge of the area, the hospital that you were practicing. I know it's 30 something years later. Have you ever visited or do you have knowledge? And do you know if anything has changed in the breastfeeding world there? You mean in South Africa or Toronto? Malaysia. Malaysia. Sorry. Oh, Malaysia. No, no, no. I wasn't in Malaysia finally. So that. Oh, that's, yeah, South Africa. Sorry, I'm confusing myself. Malaysia is where you were too late to get the notice, that's right? That's right. I have been there. I haven't been to that particular hospital. I returned to South Africa, I think it was in 2000 and 2008, I think. And the situation in the hospitals in Cape Town, for example, were not ideal by any, by any means. And um, a lot of the conversation turned around HIV, where at the time, the rate of HIV positivity amongst uh, women of childbearing age was something like 25%. Wow. Their policy was that if a woman is HIV positive during her pregnancy, then you're supposed to sit down with her and counsel her about, you know, exclusive breastfeeding if you are HIV positive, but, you know, you have to make sure that it is exclusive breastfeeding and here we can help you maintain exclusive breastfeeding or you should formula feed exclusively, but not mixed feedings because mixed feedings increased your risk of passing on the HIV virus to the baby. Well, basically, it was all just here. You should really formula feed. That was the counseling. And so the very little of real counseling so that the mother could make an informed decision. And what the problem was, was that breastfeeding amongst the uh, African population, meaning black, people of Dutch origin also consider themselves uh, Africans. The situation amongst black African people in South Africa, it was it's breastfeeding still normal. And there's a real stigma associated with being HIV positive. So mothers would breastfeed at home. Sorry, they would uh, breastfeed uh, when they were not at home, but they would give formula at home because they didn't want anybody to know they were HIV positive. So they ended up with the worst of all possibilities, that is mixed feeding. Wow, that's interesting. I'd like, I'd like to hear a couple of things. And one of them is, can you explain to us in simple terms why mixed feeding is worse? It's thought that the formula causes irritation or damage to the gut wall. And that allows the virus to get into the baby. If the baby is exclusively breastfed, then this damage does not occur. And so the virus has less chance of getting into the baby. In fact, uh, there's no 
evidence that exclusive breastfeeding is more likely to pass on the virus to the baby than exclusive formula feeding. It's the mixed feeding. Does that does that work for you? That does. You know, I ask because the I think the lay public doesn't often hear this kind this discussion. And then sometimes we also have just pregnant moms and brand new moms listening to this. And, you know, like where we think that some of the things are very familiar to us, it may be a mystery to the next person. So I like to explain things in simplistic terms. And I'd also like if you're willing to share what your current knowledge and status as far as counseling moms who are HIV positive in the United States and Canada, what do you talk to them about exclusive breastfeeding? Well, this doesn't come up uh, in my practice at all because they're almost always being told that they cannot and should not breastfeed. But in fact, the WHO, just a, I think it's two years ago, they came out with a new statement on HIV positivity and basically saying that if the mother is HIV positive but her indicators such as the, the white cells are not indicative of a high level of infectivity and if they get medication during the pregnancy and the baby is treated immediately after birth then the mother can breastfeed and and, and should breastfeed and recent article from Africa I think the Zambia they had followed mothers breastfeeding for a year and that including uh, mixed feedings after six months and these babies did as well as the babies who were formula fed so there really is more and more you know information out there that breastfeeding with a mother who's HIV positive really is possible and it should be there's no reason it should be different in North America thank you so much for sharing that with us taking a little break so I can share this info with you I am really psyched to be able to share this next piece of news with you My regular listeners are very familiar at this point with Momentum, the organization that I talk about on each show. You know the one that I say, save my life as a new mother, the organization that helped me find other mothers who were new at this whole mothering thing. They became my people. They helped me navigate that first year of motherhood and continue to mother me as I had more kids and my need for support through their toddler years and kindergarten years and elementary school years just kept being needed. I made lifelong friends and they were so helpful that I am doing all I can to continue to support the organization. I want Momentum to continue to thrive and I want you, my All About Breastfeeding audience, to experience just some of what Momentum is all about. The ladies of Momentum have agreed to give my listeners a 14-day trial membership so you can see what this mother Center thing is all about at no cost to you. Just hop on over to allaboutbreastfeeding.biz forward slash podcast. You will see a link from Momentum. It's in blue. And you just click it on and it will bring you to the page for you to sign up for your free trial. Honestly... And truly, there's absolutely no cost to you. This is just a great opportunity for you to enjoy the discussion groups and the blogs and webinars and educational pieces that are available for free for you. I will have a link to this in the show notes. And now, back to the show. I would like to hear if you have any fun stories uh, from your perspective. I know your wife is the one doing the breastfeeding, and I know it's been a long time. But I'd like to know if you have any fun or interesting stories to share about your journey into fatherhood and the breastfeeding baby. Well, I don't know. I think that the breastfeeding, it went pretty well uh, with our first baby and it went well with the other two as well. So, you know, I I can't think off the top of my head of any uh, funny or interesting stories, but I can tell you one about my wife's sister. Uh, Sure. Sure. Okay. So she was sitting in the uh, Montreal uh, train station breastfeeding her baby. And this old man, she said he must be at least 82 or 83 or 85 or whatever she said. I can't remember exactly. He sort of hobbles by her and then turns around and said, you know, it's the best thing for them, isn't it? Then he walked (laughs) a couple of steps further and turned around again and said, 
probably would be the best thing for me too. I mean, that's I, funny. I have many stories along that line, but I just off the top of my head, I just uh, just can't think of them right now. If I come up with something, I'll let you know. Probably also uh, just uh, curious about your uh, time that you spent in Africa. I don't know if you felt it at the time and knew it at the time or if it's in hindsight, but the recognition of how fortunate that your wife was breastfeeding at that time. Oh, yeah. Oh, for, for sure. Uh, because we would see babies uh, in Africa. Of course, we were not poor. We had a good living standard there, and uh, that was fine. We had clean water, which a lot of people didn't in Africa, and we weren't exposed to a lot of uh, infectious diseases because we lived in a house that was uh, away from many other people. We they, we weren't living in crowded conditions, but in, indeed, I mean, you know, I basically thought that uh, we could empty the hospital of uh, children if breastfeeding was one of the main things. If we had all babies being breastfed exclusively according to the uh, WHO recommendations, which is exclusive breastfeeding till six months and then, you know, continued breastfeeding to two years and beyond with food. Okay, so, but that's not what was happening. And a lot of babies were being given formula. And when you don't have good water, then babies die. And we used to see babies die all the time from not being breastfed or not even being breastfed exclusively. How incredibly sad and that's a very strong statement. Yes, and, and, uh, and if they, I like that. Sure, and if they weren't then if they didn't die, they were certainly malnourished and that had consequences for when they grew up. So now you're back in Canada <laughs> and tell us how you got the IBC going. Okay, that uh, I was working in the emergency department of the hospital for sick children. I was one of the staff people there. And I would see mothers coming to the emergency with babies who had symptoms because breastfeeding was either not going well or because they were giving supplements and that sort of thing. So, for example, I remember very definitely a woman who came in with a baby who was being dehydrated, though the mother was supposed to be, to be breastfeeding. And she had the baby at the breast, but obviously the baby wasn't getting enough milk. And nobody knew what was going on. Not the family doctor, not the pediatrician, not the mother, and not even the interns and residents that I was working with in the emergency department. But it was so patently obvious that the baby wasn't getting milk from the breast for whatever reason. I mean, I helped her. I mean, the baby was dehydrated. I suppose we had to admit her. I can't remember exactly everything we did. But basically, what what struck me was how terrible the advice this mother had been receiving about her, I think, three-week-old baby who was, you know, I don't know, way below birth weight. He was skinny as could be. And, you know, we see this. We see this still. This was, uh, this was you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, maybe. And it hasn't changed. Mothers are getting terrible advice. So when I saw mothers like this, when I saw babies vomiting blood and nobody knew why and I said the mother has got bleeding nipples can't you figure that one out and we had to fix that I saw all sorts of things like that in the emergency department but that's not the place to to help mothers with breastfeeding this is so I said okay then I'll start a clinic because the thing is that we had a number of pediatricians so while I was working there who who quit working in the emergency because they were burning out and so the chief of the emergency said okay well take some time off your you know emergency uh, hours and do something else something as far as possible from emergency as possible <laughs> and so I didn't know what to suggest I didn't want to do a, a basic uh, clinic that they do at the sick kids hospital because it was all sorts of things that I wasn't interested in so I said, okay, I'll do a breastfeeding clinic. And that's the way it started. And it was fine. It, uh, it, it just grew by leaps and bounds. The first full year I, I, I was, that the clinic was running, the first full year was 1985. We saw 70 mothers and babies. By the early 2000s, we were seeing 2,000. So, you know, it just grew and grew and grew. It, uh, and as I said, it, or you mentioned, at some point, I just couldn't do both emergency and breastfeeding clinic so I quit the emergency which was probably a very good idea after all there's only a limit to how many you know years you can work nights and weekends and shifts and uh, that sort of thing and that it was fine I was happy about that actually so it must have given you immense pleasure over the years to be a huge part of training 
and educating students and other healthcare providers in all things related to breastfeeding as you were able to do in the clinic? Yes, uh, we've had a lot of uh, a lot of students come through our clinic. We also get a lot of aggravation because uh, we try <laughs> to uh, teach and so there are a lot of people that don't teach. Obviously they don't come to our clinic to learn but uh, you know, we try to get the message across that, uh, you know, uh, doctors need to know something about breastfeeding and they don't seem to be receptive to that message. In fact, many are hostile to it. So there it is. Interesting resistance about one of the most important things we could ever do with our little babies, right? Sure, absolutely. I mean, there are many, many issues here, and it's not just about the health benefits of uh, breastfeeding. In fact, I, I don't say that the, there are benefits to breastfeeding. I usually say that there, are, that there are risks to artificial feeding. But I think that, you know, so many mothers, who doesn't breastfeed, actually? It's the mother who doesn't have high self-esteem often. And, you know, successful breastfeeding can help a mother raise her own self-esteem to raise her what people now call self-sufficiency, to understand her child, to be able to be confident as a mother. I think that that is so important. It's almost in many ways more important than the health benefits. I don't, I don't want to, uh, you know, minimize the health benefits or the risks of formula feeding, but I think that the relationship between the mother and the baby, the the, the feeling of competence a mother can have when she successfully breastfeeds is extremely, extremely important. And unfortunately, the health system undermines mothers in such a severe way that many mothers who should have been able to be successful at breastfeeding are not successful. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that when I started my own private practice and stopped teaching in the hospitals and having to teach classes, quote unquote, their way, one of the first things I took out was a whole lecture about the benefits of breastfeeding with regards to the health benefits. Because my feeling is if someone is already in class, they're interested, and nowadays there's plenty of room to get that information. And I just don't think that we do a huge justice uh, by talking about the health benefits because the breastfeeding rates are still quite low, even though people know what the benefits are. So we have to talk about it from a place of, like, like I know that you do, that it's just a normal way to feed your baby. And now here are some other things to learn about it. And I do talk about the emotional connection and all the other pieces to breastfeeding that are more than just the milk babies get when they're breastfeeding. So I'm glad that you talk a little bit about that. And we could, I always say that there, when I get to talking about someone who loves breastfeeding, there are, we could, each, each subject that you bring up is probably a day's worth of uh, discussion that we just don't have the time to do here, but I'm so glad to realize and hear that you feel similarly. I would like for you to tell us a little bit about the Breastfeeding Center. Are you doing any research projects there currently? Yes, we're doing some. Not exactly my primary interest. Well, it is. I mean, it's very interesting. I have a great interest in the research, but it's not something I do on a day-to-day basis. But we're we're going to look at a thousand mothers. I think uh, have several hundred already under our belt, but a thousand mothers who have been treated with domperidone in our clinic. And uh, we're, I think we'll be able to show very, very well that it's a very safe drug, contrary to all the uh, rubbish that's on the internet and also uh, in the in various magazines. This is a safe drug. We're also doing a, uh, I think we've submitted a proposal to look at issue of late onset decreased milk supply which is uh, a big issue in our clinic. We see a lot of it. And it's easier for us to study that because, unlike in the United States, uh, in Canada, women get a year's maternity leave. So we can't blame, you know, early introduction of bottles and the fact that the mothers are away from their babies. We're looking at women who started off exclusively breastfeeding, doing very well, and then the milk supply decreases for various reasons, including the fact that the baby has a tongue tie and or that the mother has been told to feed one breast at a feeding or the mother has gone on the birth control pill. So, you know, this is uh, these are two studies that are 
well, the second one's not ongoing yet. We still haven't gotten ethics approval for it, but that one is ready to go. And we there, there's some other things going on there that I don't always know about uh, because it's uh, between the students and our uh, person who's in charge of the uh, student institute. You have uh, you see so many moms, and you have a great setup to do these research studies. So you don't have to be involved in every single one, but it is of great interest to me. I'm curious to know if you have some preliminary personal thoughts on the late onset of low milk supply, if you were to remove, like you said, moms going back to work, uh, pumping, maybe not pumping frequently enough, even if you were to remove one-sided feedings and tongue-tie babies, is there anything that you are seeing that's leading towards hormonal shifts in mothers that's uh, creating a drastic reduction in the supply? Okay, so I didn't say decrease I didn't say low milk supply. I said decreased milk. Decrease. Sorry. Thank you. Because it is an important issue because when we talk about this with mothers, they'll say, oh, yeah, but I can express four ounces every couple of hours or every three or four hours. I can express four hours without any problem when the baby comes off the breast. You know, the milk squirts across the room and, you know, and say, don't believe us at first that the milk supply has decreased. And I that's and I talked about that earlier during this interview. I talked about that earlier, that it's not that the mother doesn't have enough milk anymore, although that does happen, too. I mean, you start off with a large milk supply, you go on the birth control pill, your milk supply decreases and it may actually decrease to the point where the baby isn't getting enough. But these other reasons, uh, there are many reasons why uh, mothers get a decrease in the milk supply. So you've mentioned one-sided feeding. Tongue tie is an important reason. Why is tongue tie an important reason? Well, because when a baby has a tongue tie, a baby doesn't latch on well. When a baby doesn't latch on well, he doesn't stimulate the breast to flow. So at least not the way it should. So that the milk flow slows down very quickly. And if you have that problem from early on, then eventually the milk supply will decrease as well. So there are many reasons uh, that the milk supply uh, decreases, but I would say that the most common cause is poor latch, whether it's caused by a a tongue tie or just technique, if you want to call it technique, one-sided feeding, the birth control pill. Now, whether mothers who were doing fine at one or two months And now at four months, the baby is not happy at the breast, whether that's due to some sort of change in her hormones. I don't think we have any reason to believe that unless she goes on the birth control pill or the Mirena IUD. I never even thought about that possibility. So I, you know, maybe, you know, why should it happen? That's the question. What are you considering late onset? How many weeks or months into breastfeeding? It can occur even within the first month. You get, you know, and I always used to be somewhat stymied by this because the mother would write me an email and say, you know, my baby was doing fine for the first couple of weeks and then the baby just didn't seem happy anymore and, the, you know, and the urine output went down. And, and I used to say, well, maybe the baby wasn't doing so well. And the problem in some of these cases is that everything sort of depends on the scale. So I don't believe that the scale is a good way of telling how well the baby's doing. But I think you can imagine that a baby who in the first two weeks, you know, they go to the breast and when the flow of milk slows down, they tend to fall asleep. And so the mother thinks everything is okay. But as they wake up more and more, all of a sudden they're saying, you know, the baby's pulling at the breast, baby's crying. Maybe the baby was never getting enough. But I think that we do see some cases where it was going well to begin with. And then, say, three or four weeks down the road, the milk supply has decreased for one of these reasons that I've mentioned. And the baby is unhappy at the breast, pulls at the breast, and so forth. But typically, the mothers start to come to us when the baby is three or four months old. Yeah, and it's more than likely something that's been maybe wasn't working really well initially or in the first three or four weeks and it's a gradual decline and moms come to us. I say sometimes when they're in crisis mode, when their baby is really cranking up a storm and they, they just cannot ignore their baby signs anymore right? Or, or, or misread their cues, I should say. And I find that sometimes it's because we talk about building confidence with mothers and it's probably one of the hardest things that I have to do in a very nice way is to share with the mom that 
and I'm saying it not so PC now, but you know, that perhaps their baby wasn't doing as well as they thought initially, and that it's been this gradual decline. I'd like for you to also take a minute to address the uh, domperidone issue, and you're saying you're doing a study, which is great, and I'm way interested in, in hearing the results when they come out. But as you know, I'm in Arizona, in the United States, it's really hard to get physicians to prescribe domperidone and many women wind up needing to go to the internet to get their domperidone and I'm not necessarily a fan of that only because I still think it's a medication and I would love for moms to be followed by a physician but I always say I'm more a fan of the mother who really wants to provide all of her milk for her baby or as much I'm more of a fan of that so I support them getting the domperidone I certainly wish it was different. Can you give us a little bit of the history of domperidone and why some providers are not wanting to prescribe it? Well, okay. Well, the first thing is you're in Arizona. It's not that far to Mexico. And you can can get domperidone without a prescription in Mexico. So all your people in... uh, that are close to the border there, if they have friends that are looking for domperidone, they just cross over, buy it over. Over the uh, counter in Mexico. over the over the border, yes, and and I tell them that. And also, we actually have a pretty nice population of Canadians, and and moms will just kind of reach into their pocketbook and show me their Dom Peridone. All right, and that's right, and they can get it uh, uh, if they can get a prescription. Then that uh, prescription can be filled in Canada if they know where you know, like if they have relatives uh, still in Canada. So. Dom Peridone first came out in the early 1980s. I'm not sure the exact date, but it came out early in 1980s in Canada, and it was used as a drug for uh, nausea and vomiting, and it was used in uh, people who had who were getting chemotherapy for cancer, usually, and they noticed that some of these uh, people were dying of cardiac problems. And the whole problem with this, this, this whole question is one reason that domperidone was not passed by the FDA in the United States, that, that's maybe one reason. But you have to understand that these people were really sick, that they were getting drugs that were interfering with their cardiac function, aside from domperidone, which I don't think does interfere with cardiac function. But they were, you know, so they had an increase in deaths in those patients that were uh, getting domperidone. But they, you know, these, as I say, they, they were getting all sorts of other drugs. They were very sick. And so, you know, the, that warning came out in early 2000s about domperidone uh, by the FDA. But it was passed in Canada and we used it from the middle 1980s. We used it for reflux in babies and it was reasonably effective. And there were no problems uh, with the domperidone. Then there were issues about, uh, you know, the, something came out in the, again, I'm not 100% sure of the date, but I, around 2007, 2006 perhaps. No, later than that, later than that. I can get you the information if you need it. But there was a study that was done a couple of years ago in Holland. And in Holland, they looked at sudden death in 1,300 people. And 10 of these people had been taking domperidone when they died. Okay, what does that prove? Well, that proves absolutely nothing, actually, because, first of all, the average age of death was 79. Secondly, the youngest person in this study was 55. So that I don't know many breastfeeding mothers who are 55 or older it's never been recorded in any breastfeeding mother in Canada. We checked when this first came out, we got to Health Canada and we said, have you seen any deaths in women of uh, childbearing age who were taking Domperidone and suffered an unexpected death? And the answer was no. We checked again in 2015 and the answer was no. But this study got such incredible publicity in France, they went on a campaign against domperidone, and there's just no evidence that it's a problem. And I keep asking myself, why? Why? Well, I have a friend 
Who has a friend? I know that sounds like we're getting into gossip, but it's not. I have a friend who has a friend who is on the committee, the European Medications, not Assembly, not Association. Well, let's call it the European Medical Association. They put out a bulletin against domperidone, saying it should not be used in anybody, actually, but particularly in breastfeeding mothers. And this friend of a friend is on that committee. And she was handed, just like everybody else on that committee, they, they were handed the statement, don't bother reading it, just sign it. Now, we know that there, that Nutritia, which is a formula company from Holland, and surprisingly, maybe, this study was done in Holland, and that the European Medica uh, Medications Assembly, Association, something or other, gets a lot of its influence from pharmaceutical companies. Not surprisingly, it's, you know, the FDA also gets uh, a lot of push from, from pharmaceutical companies. But the European Medications uh, Assembly Association seems to be more flexible with its uh, agreeing to what pharmaceutical companies say, just as I can explain from my friend's friend who is on that committee. And anyway, so it's become huge. It's become huge. And, you know, the problem is that, okay, in the United States, you can't get domperidone, but you can get metoclopramide or Reglan. Reglan is a dangerous drug. And I think that, you know, there's there's been documented problems with metoclopramide or Reglan that I would not want to take it. I mean, it causes in some rare cases, I'll be true enough, rare cases, it causes something called tardive dyskinesia. And the FDA actually put out a statement about this, a black box warning about tardive dyskinesia. This is a neurological problem that even if you stop the drug, it doesn't go away and it's permanent and it's forever. And so why are doctors ready in the United States to prescribe metoclopramide, but not domperidone? I haven't got the slightest idea. It doesn't make sense. None of it makes sense. You need to find a friend of a friend. Yes, that's right. <laughs> who, can, who can maybe give you that answer. I think, uh, you, need but a, it's, I think you need a pusher near uh, Tucson there who uh, can go across the border and buy 6,000 uh, pills of, uh, of Domperidone every few weeks and just spread it around the U.S. Oy vey. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm going to backtrack just a bit because I, it's my fault we got involved in talking about Dom Peridone. Can you just tell our audience how Dom Peridone can be helpful to the breastfeeding mother? Sure. I mean, it basically, it increases the uh, secretion of prolactin from the pituitary. And prolactin is the uh, hormone that increases the milk supply. And it works fairly well. It doesn't work all the time. No drug works all the time. It works particularly well in mothers who had once had a good milk supply, but for some reason the milk supply decreased. And this is why we tend to use it in the mothers that come in with a three or four month old baby with a late onset decreased milk supply. It works less well if you never produced a lot of milk, uh, but it certainly seems to work in almost everybody. And I get the occasional, not occasionally, over the last week or two, there, I think there are a lot of listers out there. <laughs> But in the last couple of weeks, I've had several from mothers who say, well, I'm taking Domperidone 30 milligrams three times a day, which is our starting dose for Domperidone. And I haven't noticed a change in the milk supply. You know, so I always wonder, although I don't want to get into long conversations with the mothers who email me uh, because I get so many. I ask myself, how do you know that your milk supply hasn't increased? And... That's a good question. How do you know? Because you're still using the same amount of formula? Well, okay. We know that if you, the milk supply, the amount of milk the baby takes probably increases as you breastfeed, as the baby gets older. We're not sure of that, by the way. You know, there are some studies that tend to suggest that the baby takes as much breast milk at five months, exclusively breastfeeding, as he takes at one month, which is kind of miraculous, but apparently it's true. But, okay, so how do you know that the baby is not getting more breast milk? And the answer is, well, because I pump and I get the same amount. 
Well, that doesn't mean anything. And I think that one thing that's so difficult for Americans to understand, but not only Americans, but I mean everybody, but particularly Americans, because so many are using bottles, because so many are going back to outside work at, you know, six weeks, two months, three months. So they're doing pumping. And that's not really a good way of knowing because a baby who's well latched on can get more milk than you can pump. A baby who's poorly latched on will get less milk than you can pump. So that's one thing. The other thing is that a bottle is a problem. It's a huge problem. And a bottle interferes with how well a baby breastfeeds. And so it may be that if the baby is going to the breast and then the mother is pumping and she doesn't get more than she used to, even though she's on domperidone, it doesn't mean that the baby is not getting, you know, more milk. It just means you're pumping the same amount. Or in fact, in some cases, mothers are pumping less. So they asked me, you know, have my milk supplies decreased since I'm on domperidone? But that not, that's not necessarily true. It doesn't make any sense, first of all, that the milk supply would decrease. But also, if the mother has more milk, and the baby is drinking better because there's more flow, then in fact, it makes sense that, the, that you pump less because the baby is drinking more. Right. Well, you, you hit the nail on the head in the earlier part of this conversation, talking about Don Peridone just now, when you said you, you get a lot of emails. Certainly, you don't have the time to respond to all of them, and you certainly don't oh, no, have I the time to, to. I respond to all of them. I just don't want to get into long conversations. Okay. Yeah, that's what I meant. So you don't have, you just don't have the time to get into a whole long conversation because it literally turns into a whole intake and consult. So what I meant to say is that you hit the nail on the head, meaning it's kind of a black hole in trying to respond to that answer. Like why? Because you're not taking the opportunity, understandably, to have known what happened before she started taking domperidone and any other changes she might have had or any other issues with her with her health issues such as you know did she have two different breast surgeries and you know i mean the list goes on and on so you just don't have the ability to know that information so it's really hard for you to respond to that question right and then sometimes we have a special form that the mothers fill out if they go through our website to ask questions but a lot of mothers don't and i think it's because they're going through uh, list serves where they don't, you know, they say, just write them, you'll be fine. And then, you know, like I get a, a 20 page resume <laughs> of the baby's first two weeks of life. Yes. And, and what do you do with that? You just, you, you just say, can't please, take the time. Please go to our website and answer the questions this way. So I thank you for explaining all that. So in, I just want to say thank you again to you for your wonderful website. My I have favorite videos. I, I teach a class and then I use the videos to support it. And I also use it during private consults. And there are, there are several videos that come up when I ask for feedback from people. And so they're, they're also my favorite. And one is when you show the difference between when a baby has a shallow latch and a baby gets a little further back and the shallow latch is the pinching nipple and hardly any right. milk. And you get further back and you see this milk spraying. And every single one of my classes, there's this, you know, verbal, ooh, that goes across the room. So that's always a lot of fun to show and really helps to support when I talk about how well the baby needs to get latched on that. That's a big part of the breastfeeding right. is, you know, that's the foundation to get the baby on it, you know, just the right angle, nice and deep enough so that if everything is fine with their oral cavity, et cetera, they can access the milk. And that's that's a big problem that we have. So that really describes it visually really well. And my other favorite ones are to show a baby that's nibbling and then drinking and good drinking. And I will frequently say to the uneducated person, show the nibbling one first and ask people to just, you know, give verbal feedback in a class, just yell it out. How well do you think the baby is breastfeeding? And a majority of the time people will say, wow, that, that baby's doing really good. And then, of course, I get to show them the, the good drinking one and they get to see the difference. And I really love those videos because in, in less than 10 minutes, those videos can really highlight to parents what it is I'm trying to get across with regards to uh, deep latch and how that affects the baby's milk transfer, milk intake, their volume, baby's weight gain, like everything. So I appreciate your website and I thank you very much for it. 
our website actually has all those videos are translated into 22 different languages. And so somebody who is, say, Spanish speaking can certainly, uh, I hope, uh, understand and be able to read the uh, text that go with that uh, video. Yes, thank you for pointing that out. I would love for you to just give us some parting words if there's any one thing that you've learned about breastfeeding in mothers. What would you like to share with us? I think that if there were just one thing, you know, there's so many things that I would love I know. to know. <laughs> but I think that if I wanted the mothers to have one thing, I would say the breastfed baby is not like the formula fed baby. You cannot take information about formula feeding and transfer it to the baby. This is where we go so wrong. And that breastfeeding is much more than milk. Breastfeeding is a close, intimate relationship between two people who are usually in love with each other. And that is what is so special about breastfeeding. What a wonderful way to end this. I thank you so much. Appreciate your time, Dr. Jack Newman. Thank you. And I wish you very well. And I will put a a link to your website. And is that a place where we can find out about future workshops and lectures that you're in? Or where can we find that information? How can we best contact you? I'll send you. All right, great. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. There were quite a few things that struck me particularly interesting about Dr. Newman. The first one is the realization that he is a gentleman who is 70 years old. He continues to work tirelessly for the breastfeeding family and travels around the world speaking at conferences and educating other healthcare providers in breastfeeding education. It is quite impressive to me that he remains active in the breastfeeding clinic where he lives in Canada. He loves traveling and he apparently has no plans to slow down as he has a full schedule of speaking engagements. It was interesting coming from him, another physician, how little training medical students and pediatric residents receive on breastfeeding. I also personally know many physicians in my life who also agree with this assessment. My son Jesse recently completed four years of intensive medical school curriculum and there was no education whatsoever on lactation and the breastfeeding mother and family. Whatever Jesse knows about lactation, milk production, prolactin, oxytocin, letdown, engorgement, mastitis, tongue ties, and yes, normal breastfeeding, He knows from our many table talk conversations. I have heard the same sentiments from several other physicians I have had on this show. They freely acknowledge that their medical school curriculum was sorely lacking in breastfeeding education, and yet this is where most parents go to learn more about breastfeeding and who they rely on when they have breastfeeding problems. Dr. Jack Newman literally said that the message he received during medical school is that breastfeeding mothers, they took more time. And because of this, they were almost discouraged to help mothers with breastfeeding. Because of this, it is no surprise that so many pediatricians really don't know much about breastfeeding, how to prevent problems, and how to help mothers when breastfeeding problems arise. One might say, this is another plug for IBCLCs, and yes, of course it is. However, it really is also to raise awareness to parents that their pediatricians may be a good resource for formula and formula feeding as they receive information and education from the formula companies, but they may not be the best resource for breastfeeding help. This is far from me having my own personal opinion as it comes from many physicians themselves. Have you ever experienced something in your life and at that specific moment or later in your life realize that that thing that happened or that thing that didn't happen probably changed the course of your whole life? Well, that is exactly what happened with Dr. Newman. He had applied to work at a university in Malaysia. He was accepted, but he didn't know this. There was a postal strike in Canada and he failed to receive the acceptance letter until 
well over a month later. Thinking he did not have the job, he accepted a position in South Africa instead. Working in an environment where he witnessed the segregation of women in hospitals, where the wealthier women were in hospitals where they had plenty of bottles and formula, and observing the clinics and hospitals where he was taking care of poor women who were not privileged to get free formula, he saw the exclusively breastfeeding babies thrive and the formula-fed babies be more prone to disease and early death. In the hospital with no formula, he was forced to learn about breastfeeding, forced to learn how to help mothers who he saw struggling with breastfeeding issues. It was this that led him on his path to helping breastfeeding moms when he returned to Canada. After working for a while in the ER department and seeing all the breastfeeding management, he was highly motivated to open up the breastfeeding clinic that he still works at today. In his interview, I very much enjoyed learning firsthand the love that he has for mothers, babies, the breastfeeding family, and how connected he continues to be with breastfeeding families and the strong need that he continues to have to educate healthcare providers about lactation. I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I did. Don't forget, go to Facebook and search for All About Breastfeeding Community and click on Join. I would love to have you participate in conversations we will be having about breastfeeding and would love to hear your thoughts on this podcast. This Facebook page is going to be a great place to let us know what you like and want more of. And if there's anything that you're not connecting with and don't really like, let that be known also. No insult taken on my part. I am flying by the seat of my pants, guessing what I think you might be interested in. And the only way I will truly know is by your feedback. On this page, you will also have a chance to be able to get to know socialize and chat with other moms in the All About Breastfeeding community and find out what's happening in their breastfeeding life. Also, don't forget, Thursday's show is also going to be a repeat. I will let you be surprised. Until that time, bye-bye.